probably the first question anyone asks, and, and it's a logical one, aren't you afraid of being stung? And what do you do to prevent it? Uh, bees, over the years, have, have developed the, the fear of fire. It's, it's the biggest risk to their existence in the forest. And man learned to harness that weakness by building a fire under a wild hive when they were going to steal their honey. What it does, it, it drives the bees to go and fill their little honey stomachs full of honey to take as much out of that hive as they can get out of there before the fire hits. We're doing that with this process. This is called a smoker. There's little bits of punky wood. People use uh, sumac bobs or pine cones or pine needles. Burlap bags work real well. You just get a little smoldering fire in there, enough to make a, a white but relatively cool smoke. You don't want to singe the bees. It's, it's more color and the smell than it is anything else, not heat. One just has to go down by the entrance of the hive, puff two or three times into the entrance, and the bees kind of hustle right in there and go load up on honey probably does two things. It distracts them, but also having a full honey stomach makes them less able to sting. That, that little stings at the end of their abdomen, when that abdomen's distended, it's hard for them to spin around and put that little stinger into you. Now, another thing on dealing with the bees, you, you don't want to walk into your bees after a tense day or you're feeling a little angry or, or tension they sense it right away. You want to go in with almost a meditation sense of mind. And as you can see today, I'm here without a, a hard helmet. I'm here without a, a veil, without the big white monkey suit and the heavy gloves. Uh, most everybody out of precaution says, yeah, suit up 100% with the heavy gloves. And as soon as you're comfortable, probably throw away the gloves. The thing about the gloves is it takes away all sensitivity. You can't tell if you've trap the bee, snap, smash the bee, and once you do that, it releases the same pheromones as a stinger does, and uh, it, there's a scent of banana oil, and the whole hive is alerted that there's an invasion going on. These hives are about, have been here a year, and I just recently this week split. This was a single hive here that sat in this position. It had this box and that far left box and one super on it. The bees had been, done pretty well this spring. It was all full of uh, honeycomb, brood honey and uh, stored pollen. So I thought I could split them. And, and that's just a process to increase my number of bees. It's not the best thing for honey. I'd have probably produced more honey with those bees by just adding honey supers and going from there, but I also want to have more hives, so I want to go into this cloning process. I removed that hive from this spot, split it, and set this box here, the other box over there. When they were open, I took five, or four, excuse me, four frames which were full of uh, brood. Honeycomb and wax. And of course, lots of bees. And this is so covered with bees, which you can see here, these flat topped uh, cells are worker bees. These more elongated bullet topped caps are drone bees, which are the, the equivalent of males. There's some honey storage here. There's 
pollen storage here, the, the little yellow areas down in there. And we weren't lucky enough to get uh, new eggs in this one. But I moved four of those full frames into this one, two more into that one, and then worked from the other end, did the same thing, took four full ones into that one and another two in there. I did not take the time to see where the queen was. She's in any, any of the five of these boxes. Those frames I moved over with as many bees as possible. Those are our nurse bees they will stay with those frames. The, uh, they will soon realize in two or three days or less that they are queenless and they will find a very small egg or early developed egg and instead of feeding that for three days as the average worker or drone gets with, mm -hmm. with what's called royal jelly, they will be fed for six days mm -hmm and that signals that cell to develop into a queen. They will build out that cell bigger, she will be better nourished, and she will hatch in only 15 days versus 18 for a uh, worker bee and 21 for a drone. But she will hatch, uh, mature a little bit, go out and do a mating flight, come back and start laying eggs. And the queens are pretty prolific, they lay from a thousand up to 2,500 eggs per day. Uh, sounds like a population explosion, but uh, it's, it's really what we need. These bees here to, in these five hives are, our, all, are all carnelian and from the uh, Eastern Europe area. I chose the carnelians over Italians because they can take a little bit more winter, but again, the health of your bees is the biggest thing. The Italians can survive winters very well. In, in this area here, I have a, a shelter belt of trees, windbreaks. You see this little wall of, of concrete blocks, which is somewhat knocked down to do this splitting. But I have a, an L-shaped secondary barrier to protect the bees from any wind that, it, that gets through the uh, trees in the wintertime. It creates just another comfort zone and uh, on a sunny day, it gets kind of nice and toasty in here. The bees can come out and do their cleansing flights and go back to the hive. They, they do not want to come out when it's below 40 degrees, but you get a nice still 40 degree sunny day. They will go out and uh, eliminate their waste, which they will not do in the hive. They keep that hive really meticulously clean.